I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, and welcome to Ask Dave 103 on radio frequency oscillators. We use as a guide the ARRL book, Hands On Radio, a compendium of monthly columns from QST that describe building and testing various radio circuits. In this case, I constructed the Hartley oscillator described in experiments 43 and 44. As you can see, it proved to be difficult to get to work. In fact, I spent all yesterday afternoon building my working model, as evidenced both by seeing it on the oscilloscope and hearing it on the radio. I did get it to work, as you see. I was hampered by two things, the first being the most important. I decided to breadboard the oscillator using a standard electronics breadboard. That's fine for audio frequencies, but RF oscillators need to be assembled with the parts far closer together. These long leads, even though they're only a tiny fraction of a wavelength, allowed the oscillator to produce spurious emissions in the 100 megahertz range which were only solved by moving wires around ad infinitum. The second problem I ran into was component identification. The ARRL makes available a Kanga kit that contains all the parts needed for hands-on radio books one and two. Resistors are no problem and are easily checked with an ohmmeter for the correct resistance. Capacitors are a whole nother thing. There are dozens of ways of marking a capacitor, and some I just couldn't figure out. The Kanga kit has a list of parts correlated with the book's experiment number, but does not list how the parts are identified. So anyway, I ended up experimenting with lots of things and ended up getting the circuit to work nicely. Before we discuss the actual circuit and results, let's step back and look at oscillators as the key building block of radio. Simply put, if there is no oscillator, there is no radio. Something has to create the radio waves. The old spark radios used a noise generator, a spark which creates broadband radio noise and then filters it some before sending that pretty bad RF on the air. Fortunately, using the new Audion and triode tubes back in the late 19-teens and early 1920s, a far better way to create RF was found using vacuum tubes. Unlike the terribly inefficient spark, a vacuum tube oscillator could create a nice, clean, continuous wave on a single frequency. This allowed much more efficient use of spectrum space, allowing hundreds of transmitters to operate where only a few spark stations could before. Just like the spark signals, the continuous wave oscillator outputs were keyed to create international Morse code. To this day, we mean Morse keyed continuous wave when we use the abbreviation CW. Now, Oscillator outputs have rather low power, so amplifiers were used to make the signal bigger for transmission. In fact, there didn't seem to be any upper limit on power, though the FCC did impose power limits. In Ask Dave number 45, I presented the basic oscillator concept of an amplifier with positive feedback. I showed that feeding the output of an amplifier back into the input with a phase shift totaling 360 degrees would oscillate. That's a really basic approach to oscillation, but in practice it doesn't work at RF signals. So a different technique is used, and for this I show you the tank circuit. A tank circuit is so named because it can store energy, although on an entirely different basis than a battery. A tank circuit consists of a capacitor and inductor, usually in parallel as shown here. If a tank circuit is charged with a pulse, the capacitor resists a change in voltage and the inductor resists the change in current, 
but by the end of the pulse, the capacitor is charged to the voltage of the pulse and the current is flowing through the inductor. The interesting part comes after the pulse is removed. The inductor wants to keep the current flowing. The current flows through the capacitor. Well, a capacitor responds to that voltage coming in the wrong way by decreasing its voltage. This continues until the voltage flips and continues to charge the other way and there's no current left in an inductor. Well, now you have a voltage across the capacitor, no current in the inductor. So current starts to flow out of the capacitor and through the inductor until there's no more voltage across the capacitor and the inductor is fully charged. Well, the current keeps flowing through the inductor until it has charged the capacitor in the original direction. When the inductor runs out of current, the capacitor starts pushing current into the inductor in the opposite direction, and the whole cycle repeats. This creates a sine wave across the tank circuit. This effect is called ringing since it very much operates the way a bell works. If there were no resistance in the circuit, the ringing would continue indefinitely but there's always resistance, so the wave will die out pretty soon as the energy is dissipated in the resistance as heat. By the way, the rate at which the tank circuit rings is a function of the value of the inductance and capacitance. As it turns out, resistance isn't involved in determining the frequency although it greatly affects the rate at which the ringing is damped down to zero. The formula for the frequency at which a tank circuit will ring or vibrate is, as you see on the screen, the frequency is the inverse of 2 times pi times the square root of the product of L in Henry's, which is the value of the inductance, and C in farads, which is the value of the capacitance. Note that as L and C get smaller, the frequency, which is the inverse, goes up. There's something called the Barkhausen criterion. Basically, it says that for a tank circuit to produce radio waves at a continuous rate, there must be enough feedback from an amplifier to keep it going. The amount of feedback must overcome any resistance in the tank circuit, and to do that, the loop gain must be greater than one. The question is how to provide feedback to the tank circuit. We know from AD45 that the feedback must be in phase at the frequency of interest. Although there were many oscillator circuits defined in the 1920s, two stick out, Culpitz and Hartley. Let's look at Culpitz first. The tank circuit consists of C1, C2, and L1. The output of the amplifier is fed in phase across C2 and ground. This gives the whole tank circuit a little kick in the right direction to overcome the inherent resistance in the circuit. Think C for coal pits. It's the capacitance that's split to provide the feedback. The Hartley oscillator splits the inductor. One complexity here is that it must be a single inductor in the tank circuit, so the feedback is provided via a tap in the inductor. Think of Hartley as H, measured in Henry's for an inductor, and you can easily tell them apart from the Colpitz oscillators. Now, this in theory is so nice and neat and pat, but in practice it turns out to be hard. Absolutely anything that causes the tank circuit capacitance or inductance to change, even slightly, affects the stability of the oscillator. For example, as a coil warms up, it expands a little. This changes the coil dimensions, and a longer coil provides less inductance, so the output frequency will drift up. Warm capacitors push the plates apart, providing less capacitance so the output frequency will drift up. Also, if the tank circuit is physically bumped, it vibrates and changes dimensions along with the vibration, creating a modulation of the frequency. This phenomenon is called microphonics.
Also, as components age, they change values, which changes the frequency. Any mechanical instability can create frequency drift. In fact, it would seem well nigh impossible to create a stable oscillator. And in fact, it is difficult to build a stable oscillator using this technology. Circuits must be physically stable and for really accurate oscillators, sometimes temperature control via heating is needed. Old radios need to warm up for a half hour or so before they're really stable. All sorts of tricks are used. An example is that several capacitors are paralleled, each capacitor having a different temperature coefficient so that the overall capacitance does not vary so much with temperature, and so on. As an aside, back when I got my novice license in the mid-1970s, hams used variable frequency oscillators to generate their signals. These VFOs had tunable tank circuits. It was thought that novices would not be able to do this successfully, so they had to use a wholly different type of oscillator based on quartz crystals to generate their signals. I had a few different crystals, so I could only operate on those frequencies. Since quartz is basically a rock, those who could use only quartz crystals were called rock-bound. Okay, so back to the oscillators. There's another issue too. If there's too much feedback gain, the tank circuit will saturate in the amplifier on both the positive and negative going pulses, and this will create a square wave rather than a nice sine wave. So there has to be some sort of feedback mechanism to keep the loop gain down to just enough to sustain oscillation. Looking at the book, C1 and C2 are in parallel, so they add. C1 is shown as variable, which means the total amount of capacitance can be changed from just C2, 200 PF, to adding another PF for 300 PF. L1 is the coil that is the other part of the tank circuit. One end of the tank circuit is attached to ground. Now, there's a small capacitance that takes a bit of the RF voltage off the tank circuit to drive an FET amplifier, the 2N4416, which was included in the Kanga parts kit. The amplifier circuit is about as basic as one can get. The purpose of C4 is to keep the drain at RF ground so the signal appears across the source. The source output is fed directly back to the tank coil via a two-turn tap out of the total of eight turns in the coil. The other two components are D1, an RF switching diode, the 1N4148, a very common diode also supplied by Kanga, and a 1 meg bleeder resistor across the diode. The diode and resistor tend to limit the voltage going into the amplifier to keep the loop gain down. This is a really simple circuit, and because no precautions are taken to make it mechanically secure, it will on purpose show many of the foibles mentioned above. The instructions say to construct this on a copper backplane by soldering components together. That is a really good idea. However, not having a copper board and wanting to keep my components reusable, I used a breadboard, which was a really bad idea. The lines are too long, which creates all sorts of spurious inductance and created a lot of spurious outputs for me. My coil is made of the enameled magnet wire provided in the Kanga kit, so it looks pretty unruly and proved equally unruly to work with. At first, I plugged the two-turn and six-turn coils into the breadboard separately, but it became clear that wouldn't work. So I actually tapped the coil and just plugged the tap into the line for the feedback. I finally made it oscillate in the 40 meter band. In fact, the oscilloscope showed a reasonable sine wave. I could listen to the radio on that frequency and hear the oscillator. The oscillator has a pretty ragged tone and drifted badly, which would be expected. 
The Fourier transform on the scope shows that harmonics are below 20 dB down, but there is some noise on the signal itself, which accounts for the ragged tone on the radio. Note the effect of hand capacitance. As my hand approaches the circuit, the frequency changes. If you've ever heard of theremin, this works on the same principle. The inductance of a coil is based on several factors, and one of them is the length. As the length of a coil goes down, the inductance goes up, so the frequency of the tank circuit goes down. You can see this as I squeeze the coil together. The frequency of oscillation goes down rather sharply. But the bottom line is that the oscillator works. It actually creates RF. All I would have to do is insert a key to turn it on and off and connect it to an antenna and it would be a rudimentary QRP CW transmitter, although this particular circuit isn't really a viable candidate for that. It would require a lot of redesign to move the components much closer together and create far more mechanical stability. Of course, over the years since the 1920s, Many improvements to oscillators made them stable and tunable. In the 1920s, oscillators were stable enough to be used to create superheterodyne radios. By the 1950s, they were stable enough to use for single sideband. If you have a simple QRP rig with a VFO, chances are the oscillator will be either a Hartley or its brother, the Culpitz. But what has happened to these oscillators recently? Well, sadly, they are completely overtaken by developments in modern RF electronics and software-defined radios. A single crystal-controlled oscillator that's paired with an integrated circuit uses this frequency as a starting place to digitally create square waves at any frequency desired in steps of a hertz or 10 hertz. Since square waves have no second harmonic but do have a third harmonic, a low-pass filter turns that square wave into a sine wave. These new circuits, with crystals designed for very low temperature coefficients, create radios that need almost no warm-up to be completely stable. The entire oscillator circuit, with all its controls, covers only a couple square centimeters of board space and are thus very mechanically firm with respect to each other. So, the oscillator is the fundamental building block of radio. It creates the RF waves that propagate without wires from one place to another. Frankly, I think this is pretty much magic. Thanks for watching. Until we next meet, 73. Next week, we'll look at the new digital mode, FT8, taking ham radio by storm. If you're set up for digital, you're set up for FT8. You can subscribe and go to the Ham Radio Answers support page. Please click like. See you next Wednesday with another Ask Dave video.